Good afternoon. If everything went well, you will have already seen a presentation by Yoon about Ely. You already know about the Emulation as a Service project and how we use emulation in it. Um, I want to talk about one specific um, problem This is relevant to this project, which is how to interface with the single emulators and how to build a generic emulator in interface for digital preservation. Um, the big fortune we have is that we have a large number of available emulators, which most of them are free and open source software, and most of them are very high quality, so um, the single emulators do very well at um, emulating their single platforms. The problem we now face is that all of these emulators have different configuration of op options and uh, different interfaces and uh, different ways to start them and to later interact with them. For example, if you want to change uh, the drive, the, the disk in your optical drive, you might want you might have to use different commands for Coemo and you might have a different command for some other emulator if this emulator supports changing disks during runtime at all. Um, so now this can be quite diverse, like we can see here for Coemo. You can pass all of the command options you have. For example, if you want to use some graphics card, or if you want to configure a network card, or if you want to just pass a disk image which is used for the hard disk drive, all of these commands are passed via the command line for Coemo. Whereas in some other emulator, the PCM emulator, which also, like um, Coemo, emulates CAN emulator IBM PC, um, there you pass a single command line option, which is a path to a configuration file in which then you would have to list all of these single options you would have to list for Coemo on the command line. And not all of these um, single emulators might support the same devices. Maybe this network card we have here is only supported by Coemo, but not supported by PCM. Um, now our, our idea to have some common interface is to um, use the same, to define a common interface for startup of on control of emulators and then build adapters for the single emulators so that a runtime which wants to run these um, emulators only have to speak this common interface and it gets then translated via the adapter which is specific to the emulator and which is combined with the emulator and translated to commands for the single emulator. So in the example, this emulation runtime um, will have will tell the emulator via this common interface to start an environment with this disk image and then the Coemo adapter will have to translate this to a command line whereas the PCM adapter will have to um, uh, translate this into a configuration file and um, start the PCM uh, emulator with a file, with a path to this file. Um, to do this, we have to, because the outside the runtime has to somehow interface with some of the resources of the um, emulator, we have to identify common resource classes which are used by all emulators and which somehow interface with the outside world. So what we have identified as the first resource class is block storage or more generally storage, um, which comes in a diverse number of uh, physical appearances. It might be a, a optical drive, it might be a hard disk drive, a floppy drive, a SD card, some cartridges or even a cassette player. And um, all of these emulators might be able to emulate different physical devices. So this uh, Commodore 64 emulator here might be able to emulate cartridges and floppy disks and cassette players. And um, generally, the emulation software will already have done part of, uh, of this problem for us because the emulation software will generally accept raw files as their input to emulate a cassette or to emulate a cartridge or to emulate a uh, hard disk drive and we can just pass from the outside, the runtime can just pass this raw file to the adapter and the adapter will then have to somehow configure it inside the emulator. Um, so yeah, for this we use raw files which is just 
a large file where uh, the offset in the file maps to the offset in the block storage device. Uh, the next resource we have identified is video output, which again might come in a diverse number of physical appearances in the emulated platforms. Um, it might come with different attached sorts of monitors. So there might be some TV or a CRT um, where the emulator might have to somehow emulate interlacing um, if this was used in the original platform. Or it might come with an arcade machine where maybe this border here is relevant too to the output because it is integrated into the emulated game. Um, but the emulator software will already have this done this for us and um, provide normally, if you start it normally on a desktop, it will provide its output in some single window already rendered down to a frame buffer, which is then currently most likely passed uh, to an X server. In future, it might be passed to Wayland server, but we have uh, settled here on using X11 as a common protocol to which both the emulation uh, software can connect to and um, render its output. And then on the other side, the emulation runtime can connect to and uh, get grab the frames rendered by the emulation and display it to the user in some way. Um, so this is only not only um, comes with different forms of displays, it might also come with different form of uh, graphics cards. Here again, it is only relevant for us as this is some kind of video output that the emulated platform has provides some or that you want to start the emulated software with some kind of video output. And from a technical perspective, the runtime does not really have to care if it is this graphics card or this graphics card or this graphics card render, uh, used in the end for the emulator because all of them will output their video in um, some window or the emulator software will output their output in some window, regardless of which card is used. Um, of course, it is uh, important for the emulated platform which card is used, but this is a step we will see later on. Um, the next common resource class we have identified is input, which also comes in a diverse, num a diverse number of ways might be a single keyboard, it might be a different kind of mice with one button or several buttons, be a touchpad, might be some touch input, and it might also be a gamepad. Um, here again, we can use the X11 protocol, which already does this for this emulation software. Um, we have a bit of a problem that in the core X11 protocol, we can generally only import um, mouse input, either relative using something like a real mouse or absolute using a graphics tablet or a touch device. Um, and we can support keyboard, um, but in the core X11 protocol, you will not be able to use a gamepad, for example. Um, this is kind of already solved by the emulation software for us because you generally start the emulation software on your normal desktop with an attached keyboard and mouse and the emulation software will already have to handle this problem how to map a keyboard to a gamepad device of a commodore 64 for example um, so the emulation software already has solved kind of this and is okay if you just input keyboard and mouse Another thing which the emulation runtime might then want to do is uh, to, for example, it, it does not have to use the user's real um, keyboard device. It might want to show some virtual keyboard. For example, if you want in the end, use the emulator together with a, uh, with a touch device, um, it might want to show a virtual keyboard. Or if the keyboard layout of the emulated machine looks very different from today's keyboards. It might also want, like for the Commodore 64, it might want to show a virtual rendering of this keyboard, um, which then can pass again via the normal keyboard to via X11 to the emulated software. Um, the next resource we have identified is audio output, which again might come in very different physical appearances, like a built-in speaker or a high quality or low quality, maybe some line output or a speaker output. It might also be a built-in 
directly beat in beeper for the circuit machine. It might just do single sounds, or it might be extreme cases like a media output where you have to connect a synthesizer to get some real audio out, it, out of it. But again, here the emulation software will already have done the job for us and render this uh, virtual devices to normal audio um, frame uh, samples, um, which then can be um, output in a uniform way. Um, here again, we have settled on a standard protocol, the Pulse Audio Server, um, which the emulation software can connect to and output its audio samples. And again, the, uh, the emulation runtime from the outside can connect to two and grab these audio samples and then somehow transfer them to the user. Um, the last common resource we have identified is network, um, which might come in the emulated um, machine, either most likely as Ethernet in different physical forms, like these two connectors, or it might come as compatible to Ethernet, like, like Wi-Fi. Um, or in the extreme case, it, it might also appear in the emulated device as a modem or as some serial connection to a modem. Um, if the emulated platform does not expect direct Ethernet connections, but expect to dial up some to some network. Um, but generally, we um, can see, we have the advantage to see that in the last decades, um, Ethernet is very, very large percentage of network. So if you can support Ethernet, um, you are generally good with all the platforms which is why we use here um, VDE, the Virtual Distributed Ethernet, which is a software switch software which can run and then the emulation software can connect to it and provide uh, Ethernet frames to its emulated machines and take Ethernet frames from its virtual emulated machines and send them back to this virtual switch. And from the outside, the emulation runtime can connect to the switch too and get all the network traffic. Um, then we have identified a resource class of not common resources. Um, this might be um, like configuring a RAM size inside your virtual machine or configuring different um, kind of processes, different kind of CPUs you might want to use inside your emulated devices if this emulation platform um, supports different kind of CPUs. Um, they are not directly relevant in this step because they do not interfere with the outside world. They are only internal to the emulator. Um, but for example, in the case of the network, you will need another switch for every network card you have to add. Whereas for the CPU, if you add another CPU inside the emulated machine, outside nothing changes. You will not have to add another switch, but uh, it's just an internal um, change. So after we have identified these different resource classes, which are relevant for, from a technical perspective, we now have to look through the different emulators and identify which concrete devices and resources they provide and they can emulate. This is a rather mechanical step because you can just go literally go through the manual of the emulator and look through all of its options. For example, you see it can emulate an hard disk drive and then you just give a name, a URL, so that you from the outside and in the latest steps you can refer this concrete um, hard disk drive which is emulated by Coemo in this example. So you give a URL for each of these options an emulator does support. And in this step, you don't really care about which this hard disk drive, which properties might this hard disk drive have. For example, you don't have to care if it's connected via s -ater or p -ater, and um, you just have to know that this is an option. This is the hard disk drive option, which Quemo supports. And um, for example, here we have these two graphics cards. You might see in the manual that Coemo can support a standard graphics card and it can support a Cyrus graphics card. And then you just give these two options a name. And if later the emulation environments asks the adapter of the common interface to use the Cyrus graphics cards, then you just use the equivalent um, parameter to Quemo. And we do this for all the emulators 
um, like for example the PCM, which is the IBM emulator tool, might support um, this default hard disk drive or might also support a default hard disk drive, might support a floppy disk drive, and might also have, have some standard graphics cards um, to which you all give a name. Um, these URLs, of course, are different, even if this are, if both of these are IBM emulate, IBM PC emulators, these URLs are different because they refer to the concrete um, device emulated by PCM or Coemo. So you would have for this hard disk drive, you would have a different um, URL than for the hard disk drive emulated by Coemo. Um, after you have Given all of these options, all of these technical options you have in the emulators, a URL, then the semantic fun starts. And um, you should really do this in two steps um, because at first you might not exactly know what this graphics card is. You might not know um, which physical card it wants to emulate. You might also um, assume a wrong card at the first step. So it is important that you in the first step only identify this technical option, like you say it is a default graphics card of PCM. And then in the next step, you can describe this as you now have this URL you can refer to. You can describe that this standard graphics card emulated by Cyrus emulates this Cyrus PCI VGA card. And um, in this step, um, what we see as important is this is the step where we connect this knowledge with outside knowledge using exist existing knowledge and existing ontologies. So we have used here existing um, Wikidata ontologies with emulates properties property and existing um, Wikipedia knowledge like this IBM personal computer URL and um, this Cyrus VJA card URL. And then we can describe at this step, we can describe that this technical QEMO x86-64 emulates an IBM PC and this, this technical card, which is present as an option in QEMO, emulates uh, this Cyrus PCI VGA card. And we can describe the same for PCM, but it turns out in this step, that actually the, the standard graphics card emulates the Cyrus VJA card and the PCM also emulates an IBM personal computer. And um, now what we now hope is that after we connect this knowledge to existing knowledge, we can use the existing knowledge for um, very interesting questions. And um, we can use like Wikipedia or DBpedia or whatever we connect this to. So after we have given all of these um, concrete devices emulated by the emulator's URL, we can connect them to the outside world and we can make them available to the outside world too. So now the outside world can refer to the standard QEMO disk drive with an URL. And um, now the existing knowledge can be used for questions like um, can this emulation environment, which is uh, using Coemo currently and has, con has configured this graphics card, also be emulated by PCM? And you might look this up. And for example, we have seen we directly described that this graphics card emulates the Cyrus graphics card, and the Cyrus graphics card of Coemo also emulates the Cyrus graphics card, so they are directly equivalent, but we also might have this via, diff, via more def um, inference steps. So uh, for example, in Wikipedia, we, in, in Wikidata, we might have knowledge that the driver used by the standard graphics card used by Coemo is also compatible to, this, to the driver used by the standard graphics card of PCEM. So then we can also say that these two machines are com uh, compatible because they might not emulate the same graphics card, but we can be sure that the driver, which is currently used by the emulation environment, can also be used for the new graphics card. Um, yes, we can, like if you have knowledge about uh, 
the drivers and about the cards in really data or some outside knowledge, we can answer like, um, is this selected network interface card emulated by QEMO compatible to Windows 95? So for example, if you have, if you present a user interface to the user um, and they select, they want to emulate, they want to run Windows 95, on this emulator, you might want to inform them then then they should not use this network interface card because it is not compatible to Windows 95. Um, the user might also come with, with some software and ask how can they run it. And um, then we can break this down this question to uh, which operating system and platform is this working on and is this software working under, which might be present in Wikidata or might be present in future because other people have contributed it to Wikidata. And um, then we can um, connect this knowledge to which emulator can emulate this platform. And then we come from the software directly to an emulator. Or we might use it if we present some user interface to the user of all the different options an emulator has we might show them an actual photo of the emulated device so that they don't just see a network interface card, but they really see a picture of this, either a logo or some real picture. Or they might want to look up this network interface card in Wikipedia um, connected via Wikidata to see which driver they have to use for this, where they can download it, for example. Uh, or we can finally, we can ask questions like um, if we have a broad range of emulators all described like this, we can ask to get logos of all the supported emulators so that we can show the emulators in a nice way. Um, so now we face another technical problem after we have described these emulators. Um, is if this is the same emulator as run, do you always get the same result? And it turns out, no. Even with free and open source software emulators, they might behave differently compiled under different versions of the operating system. So, for example, this QEMO 2.5 compiled on Ubuntu 18.04 might only be approximately the same as the same QEMO 2.5 compiled under Ubuntu um, 20.04. So, for example, um, it might be that if you hibernate Windows inside this running QEMO and try to return to restore it, um, wake up it on, on uh, this new Ubuntu 2004 compiled with QEMO, um, then you might, the uh, Windows might crash because in this case the BIOS might have changed if you compile it on a different Ubuntu. Um, and this might also be different if the QEMO version updates. So the old QEMO version might be able to emulate some systems, but maybe there is a bug in the new QEMO version and you want to run the old QEMO versions, at least for some emulators or some emulation environments. So here the idea is to put all of this, the QEMO and the base files and dependency, basically the operating system without the kernel, um, into a container and also include uh, the video output and input, this is an X server, speaking the X11 protocol in this container to input, the, to include the audio output, like a Pulse Audio server, and to import the uh, virtual Ethernet network switch, the VDE switch inside this container. And last but not least, also the adapter we have defined to speak a common interface um, to start the emulator inside this container. And after this, we close the container um, so that we do not have any more dependencies and we have a closed box um, to make um, usage of the emulators reusable and reproducible. So we do not have, we have as little external dependencies as possible, but we only can interface now with the emulator using these, using these defined interfaces. And now if you have many different emulators um, from the outside, they all look the same. They all have um, some these defined interfaces and they have some uh, metadata attached to them um, where 
they describe with concrete um, devices they can emulate. Um, if you take this um, container, this will generally be generated a Docker image using Docker, which is the most easiest way currently. Um, but if you want to distribute, we can go another step to convert it as a, as a single into a single disk image as a QCOW2, as a single to QCOW2 file, um, where with a file system on a disk image on it. Um, this is a natural choice for emulators because the disk images provided to the emulators are already or exactly in this um, format. So you already have to um, provide your hard disk drive you want to emulate to the emulator as a disk image. So it's a natural choice to also have the emulator on a disk image in the same format. And um, the additional benefit is that you can get a single file out of, out of it, which can be transferred via HTTP, HTTP and be put on a single web server, um, which, has, which can be static, um, like it can be on S3 or on any static web server, um, and then you can download. So now the next step, um, and to have the final remark and the final outlook, is to build a registry of all these emulator images for different existing emulators um, where you provide these uh, QCOW files, which then can be downloaded by emulator runtimes and um, to run emulators using these, this defined um, emulation interface we have described. And what you can here see here on this beta page is we are already using some of this metadata. Um, um, we only describe that we have a Basilisk emulator and the official website and the platform it can, it can emulate and the copyright and the repository is data which is uh, fetched from Wikidata and which can then be incorporated into this uh, Page. So, thank you very much. So, Klaus has uh, has offered to answer any questions. Uh, do you have any? Any questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Um, which device category? Have you run into any device categories that are particularly problematic for this style of emulation? Uh, and are there any that you're unable to emulate against? Um, the most challenging uh, device category right now is uh, GPUs um, because there's nothing yet that we can say for the, uh, we can make use of in, in, in terms of emulation. But otherwise, most of the device categories we, we have identified are, are pretty standard and we can hide most of the details um, from the software, from the software framework like Easy um, uh, using it because the, the, inter, the interaction between the framework the user is using and the emulator is, is quite limited. So it's, it's uh, a visual output video. Uh, it's audio output and this is some kind of interaction uh, via keyboard or mouse or whatever interaction device the user has. Thank you. Now the talk was about software emulator do you also plan to integrate uh, hardware emulators, FPGA emulators somehow? We do not have uh, yet a use case for that. I mean, that's, that, that could be interesting, but it's, it's not a real use case because most of them are really special cases. Uh, but uh, what we haven't talked about, most of the emulators can also be used, and this is, this is one reason why we use this. Um, most of them are toy emulators, but some of them are, uh, can be used in, in, in a more scientific setting, so for, for data processing and, and so on. 
and by abstracting the interfaces to the emulators, we can use this emulator in a, in a headless way, so we can we can make it just as a as an input output software product, um, and and run stuff without um, real user interaction. So this is what we have. Uh, in, in order to define your common interface, you have to align with uh, Wikidata. Do you find gaps in what was already described in Wikidata that needs to be added or le less, less well described in, in, in this common ontology? Um, well, I would say the situation is quite mixed. Um, at least most of the, the elements have, have stops and we can build on the stops. And the idea what we have is, I mean, um, this is not a new idea. I, mean, I think there are some key veterans here. Uh, so we do, we redo something that Keep already has done in uh, 15 years ago. So we package emulators, but the, the the difficult task is to describe them. So what Rafael tried to describe was, um, so so we we create stops and point to external knowledge uh, to external, external knowledge bases and connect to them and hope uh, that we can piggyback in the future uh, on other people's work that they improve uh, by trying and error um, and refining this information over time and we so all these packages we publish then uh, will be improved naturally by just by other people contributing to Wikidata and uh, refining the information about I don't know some some obscure graphics card or uh, whatever uh, we this emulator use, and then we can make decisions, uh, like Rafael sketched that we can. Uh, so at, emulators need to be replaced in the future. These, of course, at some point. So, so, so we we want to make automatic decisions. Uh, which one is compatible? Uh, what what happens to the software? Does the software work anymore? Um, and the structured data like we have in, in, in Wikidata is able to, to give these answers in a, in a quite automated way. So we can deduct the... Did you, did you find any trouble getting the data you needed into Wikidata? Uh, yes. <laughs> Can you talk about that? Uh, well, uh, we we stopped bothering with that actually, uh, trying to get data into Wikidata. Um, we m currently are mostly using it, uh, and w because we do not, well, we are computer scientists and uh, not metadata specialists. Someone uh, has to read the documentation about I don't know whatever network card and uh, puts that into properties available for Wikidata. Our uh, view on that was mostly um, how can we productively combine this knowledge base and especially the ontology so we can deduct something from it. It is a network card, it is a very specific network card, or it is a more specific info, uh, uh, revision of that network card. Um, and make that use in a, in a, in a technical, technical way and make decisions on that. 